Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this webinar. I'm uh, Marianne from Fluitech, Fluitech Europe. Um, and I'm really happy to um, announce next session, Maintaining Your Condition-Based Maintenance Program, performed by Matthew Moore. Okay, Matthew, good luck. Thank you very much, Marianne, for that warm introduction and welcome to everybody joining us today. Today I'm going to talk about maintaining your condition-based maintenance program, or what I'd like to call condition-based maintenance maintenance. I'd like you to hold a thought as we go through this webinar in that you can carry out condition monitoring without condition-based maintenance, but you can't carry out condition-based maintenance without condition monitoring, and this will become evident later. So hi, I'm Matthew Moore, and I've been a subject matter expert in condition monitoring and vibration analysis for coming on for 30 years. I've been the technical author of global guidance documents in condition-based maintenance, and site-based strategies in condition monitoring and the generation of work procedures. I've been involved in the implementation and remote support of over 100 condition-based maintenance programs all around the world in the oil and gas industry. And I've learned a lot from the last 20 years or so of being involved in web development and a software architect for the digitalization of condition-based maintenance. This has taught me about how to not just digitalize the way we do things, but how to break them into workflows and define who does what. I'm now an independent freelance consultant and I'm involved in training. So today we're gonna to talk about three main topic areas. We're gonna be looking at stakeholders. What are their roles and responsibilities and how do their different perspectives influence our program? We'll then look at communication the who, where, why, what, how we interface with each other and the workflows and how we communicate our information. And we'll be rounding it off by looking at KPIs and looking for KPIs that are effective, meaningful, and actually benefit our program. So our stakeholders. Everybody on our plant is in a way a stakeholder, but if we were to break them down into core areas, We'd be looking at operations, maintenance, management, and then the kind of the third party external bodies. Our operations are mainly focused on our process and production. They're really concerned about what are we doing today? Are we going to meet our production target today? Everything is surrounding making sure that process runs efficiently with no upsets. Our maintenance department, however, has a slightly different perspective. They're worried about what our plant's going to be doing tomorrow. They're looking more into the future about maintaining equipment now in order that it's still going to provide and work for us in the future. And then we have our management. Our management are very much interested in the bottom line. It's very important to them that everything is maintained, because if you can't maintain your present operation, how are you going to improve upon it going forward? And then we have our external people. The guy down in the bottom right is always smiling. That's because if he's an external service provider, he's going to get paid for providing condition monitoring services. However, if he's an external OEM and you're not operating your equipment or maintaining your equipment correctly, he's going to make money out providing with more spares, repairing and replacing your equipment. One thing that everybody who gets involved tends to work out is there's a juxtaposition between operations and maintenance. Maintenance or the condition monitoring program will want equipment switched over in order to monitor it. However, operations are going to be apprehensive about switching anything over, which will cause a process upset. So there's always going to be teamwork involved, but there's always going to be a slightly conflict of who's got the uh, of interest. However, everyone should remember and bear in mind that everybody is a stakeholder in the plant safety and reliability. Everybody has a role to play. So looking at the condition-based maintenance program in particular, and looking at the roles and responsibilities, the best way to classify these is to use a RACI chart, where we look at who's responsible for completing or carrying out an action, and then who's accountable, who makes sure that action is actually, or that task is actually completed. The people that are consulted are the people that you discuss before you make a decision or before the action is put into place. And then the people that are informed are the people that find out about the decision 
of that action. Then for quality control purposes, it's very useful to have somebody that validates or verifies what we're doing is being done properly. And then there may be a signatory that signs off on those actions. So to put those into context, depending on the size of your plant, you may have different roles. And on a smaller plant, people may perform multiple roles. So rather than break down your tasks to individuals, you should break them down into the roles themselves in case multiple uh, one person carries out multiple tasks. In this example here, we're considering that we've got a condition monitoring department. That could be internal or external, but they work in analyzing the data and making recommendations on that data to feed our condition-based maintenance program. Our maintenance department, if they use on-site technicians to collect data, they will have an involvement in the data collection process and they will help collect the data to pass it on to our condition monitoring team who will then carry out the analysis. Once that analysis is completed, then there's the time to recommend maintenance actions. At this stage, our condition monitoring team should be consulting with maintenance to identify what is the most appropriate cause of action and in what order it can be done and to prioritize it and to plan for it. Then once these maintenance actions are agreed, it's then passed over to the maintenance team who are then accountable for completing it. So you may have a maintenance planner that signs off on it or puts them in the CMMS system, but the maintenance department are overall going to be responsible for completing those actions. Then I'd always recommend that you have review meetings. And in these review meetings, everybody gets together to discuss the actions that have been raised and to discuss what the next steps are, discuss anything that's outstanding, anything that is new. But this is the traditional way of doing it. We also need to bear in mind that things are changing in our industry and now we might be using AI and machine learning. We need to think, can we give AI and machine learning responsibilities? Well, let's see an example. Let's say we started to use wireless vibration sensors, for example, and they use machine learning algorithms to carry out our analysis. We could be cutting out all of the data collection activities and the main role of the condition monitoring team. So rather than having a condition monitoring team now, we have artificial intelligence and machine learning making those analyses. But what I'd always recommend is you still have a subject matter expert that can verify what they're doing is correct. However, this AI and machine learning aren't going to pick up a spanner and go and fix the machines. So their role is just to identify anomalies. It will then still be the condition-based maintenance department and the maintenance roles to action those things and to be accountable for completing the actions that have been highlighted. The other problem with our machine learning is they can't participate in a meeting. So I think going forward, we do need to change our perspective slightly on who undertakes which roles, but the condition-based maintenance part is still really gonna be focused with the maintenance department. One thing I've always found, to have a successful program, you need a champion. And if that champion is in your maintenance department, you're onto a winner. I remember a maintenance superintendent many years ago who was so into the program, if there was ever a problem with the machine, he'd go and find a data collector himself and go out and monitor it and take a really active interest in what's going on. That's one of the best condition-based maintenance programs I've seen. And unfortunately, when he moved from that particular plant to another plant, being a champion moved with him because the plant that he moved from, their KPI started to dwindle, yet the site he moved to started to improve back to the levels that he was used to. He was the champion. He made everything happen. And if you can ensure that champion is in maintenance, because if the champion is only doing condition monitoring, then they may be great at analyzing. They may be great at making the most recommendations. But if nobody believes in the program or carries out their recommendations, we're falling into that trap. We're carrying out condition monitoring without condition-based maintenance. Everybody needs to be involved. Everybody needs to be interested and a champion will always help. So how about the communication? To understand the communication, it's always a good idea to put things into workflows. And this is a, this, what you see here is sometimes called a swim lane diagram, also called a cross-functional workflow. What we have down the left is our main activities. And then across the top, we have the responsibilities. Who does those actions? 
and then we break them down into a workflow, the order in which they're carried out. So our maintenance planner may initiate the work order in the CMS system, tell the maintenance superintendent this is now to be carried out. He'll approve that it's now able to be carried out. It's scheduled to be carried out. He has people available. The mechanical supervisor may assign his technicians to collect the data. Those technicians collect data. That data then gets passed on to the analysis team. Those analysts then analyze the data and generate reports. It's always useful to have a second opinion and a condition monitoring lead that approves and issues those reports back to the maintenance department. And then the maintenance department, once they've read the report, will facilitate a meeting. It's always very good to have the meeting involving the stakeholders. The people that is the maintenance planner that's gonna plan your maintenance, the maintenance superintendent who's gonna make the decisions on the maintenance, and also the analysts or the CM team involved in identifying why they think there's a problem. And if you're a condition monitoring analyst, one thing to bear in mind is, do people understand your reports? There's no point in giving a condition monitoring report to somebody who doesn't understand what he needs to do with it. What you need to bear in mind is they aren't going to be experts. If they were experts, they wouldn't need you in the first place. So if you're a vibration analyst, for example, and you're quoting to them, oh, I've got five millimeters per second on this machine, their first response is going to be five. Is that a problem? Is that good? Is that bad? I don't understand that. So what are the things you would need to do and explain to them? And you know, they're not going to understand a vibration spectrum. They certainly probably won't understand a time waveform. But what they will understand is if you can present with them a nice trend that shows that there's deterioration and that you've breached an alarm level and it's only going to get worse. And we think, oh, based on the time to date, yeah, there's another six months before it reaches an alarm level. So you need to put your values in context to make sure they're meaningful. And also, please use layman's terms. You know, don't describe everything in technical jargon. Describe it in simple language they understand. Tell them what's wrong. Tell them what's likely caused it. And then tell them not just what action needs to be taken, but the priority of that action. Does it need to be taken in the next week? Can it wait three months? Is it an early detection? Can it wait six months? One thing I always find an issue with some condition monitoring reports is their recommendation is to monitor it. Well, you are monitoring it. So if the recommendation to monitor something comes back and says, oh, just keep an eye on it and monitor it, we're doing that anyway. It's not really a meaningful recommendation. The meaningful recommendations is when a physical action or activity needs to be done, which wasn't just the routine monitoring. And remember, communication is more than just reporting. In this day and age, we have the benefit of digital systems. They're really useful because they keep information up to date. They ensure everybody can interact with that information in more or less real time. You'll have forum threads, you'll have ability to feedback on any recommendations that are made. Management may suddenly start to take an interest in the program because your KPIs look good on their dashboards. And in the day and age of remote workforces, Digitalizing things is very useful because then remote distributed workforce can access all this information from home or from other sites or from head office, for example. The one thing you still need to consider, though, is some remote sites may have poor internet connectivity on site, and so they can't engage with these systems in the same way. The other problem we may see with going more and more into automation is lacking that human engagement. So I'd always recommend that there's always physical meetings or conference calls to discuss any findings in the condition-based maintenance program. For many years, I was designing systems to allow people to go and look at the latest status. They don't always log in, but what they will do is attend a conference call and discuss those findings so that then you can update that system so everybody's updated. So what are the good and bad signs of whether your program, what are the telltale signs of you think your program's going well or not? Well, obviously, if we're applying condition monitoring and applying condition-based maintenance, we shouldn't expect, or there shouldn't be so many unexpected failures. We don't want to see indifference to the program and lack of engagement. We want the stakeholders involved, especially the maintenance department. If our management only become aware of the program because there's been a failure, that's a bad sign. 
And I'm not a big fan myself of cost benefit analyses where they're used to justify an ongoing program. Yes, they do hold their place to recommend to implement a program, but when they're being used when the program is always operational, it shows that people are focused on cost rather than value. So there may be a perception that they're not getting value from the program. It's not obvious that there's value. And if you have to justify something, it's not obvious that the, the, the program is delivering. The other problem you get is if you raise recommendations, which remain outstanding forever and a day. You know, if you've got a recommendation that's a year old or two years old, the immediate response is going to be, well, if this recommendation is going on for two years, surely the machine should have failed by now if the diagnosis was correct. So just be aware of how you deal with long-term outstanding actions. But looking on the more positive side of things, obviously we expect fewer failures. The thing about fewer failures is if you're not having failures, it goes unnoticed. If you're having failures, everybody's looking at the program for the wrong reasons. You want positive engagement. If everybody's helpful and they get involved in the data collection, they get involved in the meetings, they turn up for the review meetings, you know you've got engagement. And let's see your management focus on the wins. You know, if they can show KPIs to the board showing, look what we've done, we've captured this, we've saved this much money, we stopped a failure that saved us millions of pounds. That's when they're going to be engaged. That's when they're going to promote the program for you. And good wins make good case studies. So rather than doing cost benefit analyses to justify the program, you're doing mini case studies that say, we found this, it saved us this much money, look at how good and how optimized the maintenance department now is. And also, if all of your condition monitoring recommendations remain in a report somewhere, they're not going to be effective. We need to make sure those recommendations are in the CMMS system now. The plan has taken the recommendations from the condition monitoring report, and they are now in the maintenance management system. So they're now going to be addressed. They've now got a timeline. And something to bear in mind, good news travels fast, but bad news is going to travel faster. Let's look for the good news first. So how about looking at a few key performance indicators? Well, what makes a good KPI in the first place? You know, if we set our KPIs too high with an unachievable target, if it's just planned to beat maintenance with a stick and keep maintenance on their toes, they're not going to be very engaged. They're going to think they're fighting a losing battle. But if you do the opposite and you make the target too comfortable so everyone gets a pat on the back, it's not going to engage, it's not going to push the program forward. They're just going to fall back on what they feel comfortable with or confident in their comfort zone. So in my view, KPIs don't need to be a carrot or a stick, but what they should definitely do is drive positive behaviors. Any KPI that creates an improvement and not an improvement in, oh, it's a number we need to meet, but an improvement in the behavior that we now switch over our duty and standby machines to make sure everything gets surveyed. Now, even with automated data collection, that doesn't automate switching the machines over to make sure we got data on both our duty and our standby. That's still a human behavior that needs to happen. We also want them to be achievable so that people think there is a target they can meet. And once they've met that target, they're going to maintain that target. And one very important thing is who you apply the KPI to. Because if you're applying the KPI to the maintenance department, yet operations won't switch over equipment, the maintenance are never going to meet their KPI because there's a factor outside their control. So make sure you've got different KPIs based on the different people involved so that they meet their targets and you don't do a general target that isn't under everyone's control. And the best KPIs will facilitate benchmarking. So if you're operating one plant, you can use the same KPI on another plant and see how they're performing and get the lessons learned from one plant and apply them elsewhere. Condition monitoring KPIs tend to be quite quantitative. They tend to be a number, so they're very easy to track. Back in my day, when I first started out in condition monitoring, the KPI that always used was percentage surveyed. So if you were going out to site, collecting the data, analyzing the data, yeah, percentage survey was quite a good indicator because it meant the data was collected and you were looking at it. However, in today's um, 
signs of artificial intelligence and things where data is being automatically collected. Collecting the data is now taken for granted. Collecting the data isn't a KPI. It should always be collected. So we need to think more in terms of the end goal. And in condition monitoring, that end goal is to make sure that we've assessed the machines. So if we go through this workflow here, yes, the first thing we do is look at what has been surveyed. And if it hasn't been surveyed, it's a negative KPI. So this isn't just somebody going out and collecting data. This is also the fact that machines aren't, duty and standbys aren't being switched over. There's no new data for some of the machines. Then the first pass analysis would be looking for an anomaly or an alarm breach. So whether this be a human analyst or an automated analysis, analyst, we'd be looking, has it breached an alarm threshold? If it has, we're going to ask, well, have you analyzed it? Because if you haven't analyzed it, you've now got a negative KPI. If you have analyzed it and you've reported on it, you've carried out what we call exception reporting. You're only reporting on the things which have an anomaly. And that completes our process. That means we've got an entire process KPI for the condition monitoring, not just what we've surveyed, the fact we've analyzed it and the fact we've reported on it and somebody's aware of it. If we go down the other track where data hasn't breached an anomaly, it hasn't made an alarm, has it been analyzed? Well, if we don't analyze it, it's what's called exception analysis. And I'm not a fan of exception analysis because what happens if your sensors have stopped working? You may not be getting alarms anymore. What happens if you've got a failure mode that doesn't cause an increase in vibration that's perceptible to an analyst? What if it's a reduction in vibration and that wasn't expected? You've got a machine learning model that only looks for an increase in change. It doesn't look for reduction. So let's, let's say we should periodically analyze all of our machines, not necessarily all of our data, but all of the machines over a longer period of time to ensure that there's no anomalies going undetected. And if we report on that, that isn't actually exception reporting anymore because it's actually full reporting. We're reporting on everything, but we still come to the end of our path and we've still done an entire process KPI. So let's look at KPIs that cover the entire process and not just one element of it. Condition-based maintenance KPIs, on the other hand, are a little bit more difficult to assess because they tend to be more qualitative than quantitative and they can actually be counterintuitive. I was using a KPI for a number of months or maybe a year or two before I realized that there was a get out. There's a way you could avoid it. If you were to base your KPIs on the number of condition-based maintenance actions that are raised, well, the way to beat that KPI is to stop monitoring the machines. Because if you don't monitor all the machines, you're not gonna discover all the faults with it. So that KPI would actually promote poor practice rather than good practice. So the good practice KPI is to ensure you analyze and monitor all the machines. The bad practice KPI would be finding ways to stop monitoring them because you don't want to raise recommendations. So the other thing that we would obviously be considering with condition-based maintenance KPIs is knowing that we've got false positives versus false negatives. Because until we interrogate what we've done in condition monitoring, we don't know whether we were right or we were wrong. And depending on how you've tuned a machine learning model, false positives versus false negatives may be more apparent which way or the other. However, what you should always bear in mind and management should be aware of it, and you should communicate is condition-based maintenance and condition monitoring aren't perfect. The main thing is the benefits should outweigh the costs. You know, when I've seen failures occur and people go, oh, the condition monitoring program is not working, we then found out that they hadn't collected data on the machine for a year or that there'd been a recommendation that had been in place for ages and nobody carried it out. So don't think just because there's been a failure, it's your fault. Make sure that it's investigated and you learn from it. So in closure, the key to a successful condition-based maintenance program is to understand your stakeholders' perspectives. Yes, we should all be on the same team, but different people will have different perspectives. The maintenance department obviously want to have optimized maintenance to have the best utilization of their resources. If people have got defined roles and responsibilities, they know the part they play. If they know the part they play, they will be more engaged. And if you can find your champion, your champion can make sure everybody follows their responsibilities. They can make sure everybody's engaged. 
Using cross-functional workflows helps people not just know their responsibilities, but know how they interact with each other and at what stage they take on responsibility. And let's communicate effectively. Let's not leave it all in the web. Let's make sure we have those online meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, conference calls. Let's sure we're discussing the plant operation and we're sure we're discussing the best maintenance to carry out. And if we employ KPIs that drive positive behaviors, our program will improve. And if your program is improving, you will know it because when your program is working, you no longer need to prove your program is working. You know, if people are always justifying the program, it's not working. If people know the program is working, they're engaged, you've got a good program. So thank you for your time. If you'd like more reliability, please reach out to me. You can find me on LinkedIn. And also if you're in the UK or if you know about Mobius and Mobius Connect, if you were to join Mobius Connect, you can join a community around the world. If you're based in the UK and you join, come and join me in the community in the UK, which I lead. You'd be most welcome. You can at any time engage with me, discuss. And uh, I hope you found today's presentation useful and I welcome any questions. Matthew, have you seen the question, the one question in the q and I am just taking it now. Absolutely. There's a question from Ahmed Mazar Bashir. Which of the four is most important? Yes. Um, which of the four? Um, if I take it that this might be which of the four um, stakeholders more important? Well, obviously, management have a big role to play because management are going to be supporting the program, they're going to be funding the program. They're going to be making sure that the maintenance department have enough resources. So if the maintenance department is really stretched, the program is not going to work. However, with a good program, the maintenance department are going to optimize their resources. So the good thing about doing condition-based maintenance is you're predicting what resources you need in the future. And in so doing that, you can make sure that management are aware of what of the team we need to carry this out. Yeah, I, okay, I are there any so more questions? Uh, yeah, we still have three minutes to go, but um, yeah, okay, yeah. Matthew, what do you think? Shall I uh, end the session? Uh, I or can, we... I can, add, I can add a closing comment on um, some thoughts okay. on the English. Go ahead. Everybody in the industry should be aware at the moment that we've got artificial intelligence and machine learning coming in. That's going to be great for future generations. But what we need to do is pool our experience and expertise now to train those systems so that they will be useful in future. Because as those systems take over, the expertise and skill, there'll be less of it in the there'll be less of it on your site when more and more things are automated. So I would encourage people now to make the best use of all of their experience and expertise and actually to start training their experience and putting that into these new digital systems now before it's too late. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. Okay, thank you for everybody's attendance today. Thank you for LRVS for inviting me to attend and thank you, Marion, for hosting me today. Yes, with pleasure. Have a nice day. Thank bye you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.